eh, en lo que empezamos. Recuerden que esto es live, así que pongan por favor sus celulares a vibrar este, y traten de, ¿verdad? de que como esta acústica de no hacer exacto, de no hacer mucho ruido para que no interfiera con el audio para las personas que están afuera. Si tienen que salir, este, aguanten la puerta al salir porque esas puertas como que es, hacen un ruido horrible cuando se tiran. Este, y nada, estamos esperando. ¿Ya? Good afternoon and welcome. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos sean todos. Welcome to the Heads Virtual Best Practices Showcase celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Jubelkis Montalvo, Heads Executive Director, and I, I, and I, I will be your host uh, this afternoon. First, Heads would like to acknowledge the presidents and board member representatives of its member institutions in Puerto Rico and the United States and companies us today. To all of you, thanks you for sharing this special occasion with us. Likewise, Heads would like to recognize the collaboration and support of the Universidad del Este y Artes y Universidad del Este and the support of Escuela de Hospitalidad y Artes Culinarias, Jose Atoni Santana staff, who made possible this event and live transmission. We are deeply grateful for your support, and we also would like to welcome all participants here at Universidad del Este and all participants watching this, this inaugural event through the internet. We really appreciate your interest and support to this HES initiative. We kindly request that you turn off your, uh, or in vibrancy or silent mode, all your mobile to have your fully attention uh, to this session so you can benefit from this initiative and also to avoid interruptions during this live transmission. This virtual best practices showcase is proposed to take place every other year to alternate with the face-to-face -face conference. This combination of virtual and face-to-face -face best practices showcases will provide a continuous space for heads member institutions sharing their expertise in dealing with the Hispanic population and finding ways to provide them with opportunities to succeed. Moreover, uh, participants will be not only able to learn from the showcase works, but also find solutions to many common issues and even, and even establish new possibilities for collaboration with other institutions and potential partners. This historic event brings together for the fifth time in Heads Chronicles, but the second completely online, an exceptional amount of experts to highlight the most prominent opportunities to enhance Hispanic higher education through the savvy use of technology. This outstanding group of professionals creates such an extraordinary synergy from which we hope you take advantage during this event. The Heads Consortium is overly excited to have been able to obtain for this event the participation of member institutions from Puerto Rico, United States, and Latin America. All of Heads institutions are nationally and internationally known for being at the forefront of the integration of new technologies to serve its students and specifically the Hispanic community. This was confirmed through the receipt of over 10 proposals from all member institutions to participate in this event. It, it, it will also be demonstrated through the insightful discussions and the panel of experts which heads will be presenting this afternoon. We will also want to recognize the outstanding collaboration of the evaluation committee who were in charge of review and score the presentations to be able to select the top ones that are presented at this event. Thank you very much for your time and hard work. Now, as part of the greetings remark, please welcome Universidad del Este Chancellor Alberto Maldonado, who kindly offered these outstanding facilities to celebrate this event. And also he is representing Dr. Jose F. Mendez, President of Ana G. Mendez, in this welcome. W please help me welcome Chancellor Maldonado. Uh, 
Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Nuevamente es un placer tenerles aquí en, en la Universidad del Este. Y qué bonita oportunidad para que empecemos a trabajar juntos. Yo vuelvo a seguir con mi discurso de que llegó la hora de que las universidades trabajen juntas unas con otras y se apoyen unas a otras. Porque de, en última instancia nuestro trabajo va dirigido a los estudiantes que nosotros formamos en las instituciones. Y cuando salen, salen a servirle a la sociedad nuestra y respectivo en qué universidad se prepararon. Así que dentro de ese espíritu le doy la más cordial bienvenida aquí a la Universidad del Este en mi nombre y en nombre del señor José Fernández. Y espero que se repita esa visita aquí. Son más que bienvenidos en esta universidad. Gracias, Chancellor Maldonado. Uh, to conclude our welcoming remarks, I would like to present Manuel Fernos, President of Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, who was re-elected Chairman of the Board of Directors of Heads in the last June meeting, during this, during this summer board meeting in June 2014. Please welcome President Fernos. Uh, good afternoon to all here present and those who are watching us through internet. On behalf of the Board of Directors of Heads, I want to welcome you all to this uh, uh, workshop uh, showcase that we do uh, every year, one year face to face, the following year through internet. Uh, we in the Board of Directors are fully aware that the uh, principle of economics on limited needs and limited resources uh, is affecting more and more the administration uh, on each one of our institutions. And therefore, we have to move from competition to collaboration. And that's the whole uh, principle and the whole idea of this showcase. Here, we allow to copy from each other. We don't allow our students to copy during tests. But here, we, on the contrary, hope that we will copy from each other the good practices. And that's the whole idea of this showcase. Today, we are going to deal with three topics retention and assessment efforts in distance learning, pedagogy strategy uh, for online courses, and mobile technologies. So we have a good panel, uh, and I hope that we will all learn and copy the good practices they are going to talk about. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidente Fernos. And now we would like to open this conference event with the panel discussion. And the panel is composed by three of collaborators of our member institutions, one from Berkeley College in New York and New Jersey, another from Universidad de Puerto Rico, and from uh, the last one from Universidad of University of Texas Pan American. Panelists, let me remind the rules, panelists will have 20 minutes each to share their insights and, es and experience in their areas of expertise. As at the end of the panelists' presentations, Dr. Gloria Vaquero Lleras, president of National University College, will be the moderator of an open discussion and questions from the audience. And participants watching this event through the internet can send their questions via email to info at heads.org. Let me repeat again, info at H-E-T-S dot O-R-G, org, the organization, to participate as well. We would like to start by introducing our first panelist, Ms. Carol Smith Cuevas, Assistant Provost of the online Berkeley call, online area at Berkeley College, who will be taking talking about retention and assessment efforts in distant learning. Please help me welcome Mrs. Carol Smith Cuevas. Thank 
you so much. Um, I apologize, my Spanish is very poor, even though I have a last name that's Cuevas, that is by marriage. Um, I also want to apologize because I have about 27 pages of really fantastic data that I was not going to bore you with, and also I wasn't going to show you because I only have 20 minutes. So I'm going to condense everything into a nice qualitative piece for you, but for proof of purchase, it's right there on my laptop for you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about retention and assessment in distance learning. Um, I just wanted to give you a little presentation overview based on some of the uh, elements I was asked to cover. So today we're going to talk a little bit about enhanced student support services, student assessment, technology, and promoting quality. A little background about Berkeley College so that you understand the context in which uh, we operate in. We have 10 campuses, three in New York six in New Jersey and one online. We have approximately 8,000 students that take a class uh, or more uh, across the system. We have about 35% of our students will take at least one online class each quarter and about 1,100 students who take their, their full course load completely online. Uh, we began offering online classes in the fall of 1998, and I like how we say that we started offering online classes because it was one. But it was very impressive, one. Uh, and we just celebrated 15 years of online learning, so we're really cheesed about that as well. We have approximately 180 full-time and adjunct faculty who teach online, and about 25 now, I think that's up to 28 full-time faculty who teach their entire course load online. So that's four courses a quarter. We have over 270 sections on the online course schedule. And of those 270 sections, we offer all of our programs online with the exception of interior design. Although I've been asked to try to make that happen, but I'm really not sure how it's going to happen. And then we have uh, six full-time online chairs that uh, manage and oversee our four schools, our Larry L. Lewing School of Business, our School of Professional Studies, our School of Health Studies, and our School of Liberal Arts. Um, another piece of my slide that's missing that I just noticed, which is why I brought my, my laptop, is that 26% um, of the students who take classes online at Berkeley College are Hispanic. Another 25% are of African-American uh, descent. We have about 24% that are undeclared. And then we have a small population of, um, <clears throat> of white students. But throughout the system, we have the same. We have about 26% of our population is Hispanic. Uh, we have about 25% African-American, 33% undeclared. And then the rest we have with our white population. So we have a very robust, ethnic, uh, diverse body of students across the system and in online. It totals to about 79% ethnic minority if you put everyone in one lump sum. So we have enhanced student services that we offer to our students at Berkeley College. We have a dedicated uh, student support services and academic support, advisement, admissions, library, uh, student accounts, financial aid, and so our 1,100 students who take classes through Berkeley College online will have a dedicated person from uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to speak to Monday through Friday and on Saturdays 9 to 3. So although we've sent out various surveys just recently and actually one piece of information we'll get to is our um, online retention plan where we asked our students when did they want us to be available to them. Uh, that yielded some very interesting results on when they felt we should be available to them. And it's actually in the works just as a little precursor to it. It was 8 to 10 at night. So <laughs> you might have heard this already before. Okay, so each one of our functional leads of, of these departments also serves on an online executive committee. And of that online executive committee, the, they could be a director or a dean of a department, they also serve on our uh, online retention committee uh, with representation from faculty who teach online and also our institutional effectiveness department. Um, 
We had an online retention plan that basically was involved with, um, It was basically involved with the goal to improve student retention in the online campus. We do a good job to keep in competition with our on-site uh, campuses, but as you know, working at a distance, taking classes at a distance, sometimes the anonymity gets in the way and we have some barriers that maybe the on-site students wouldn't have. So the online uh, retention committee was brought together to discuss those barriers and what we can do to overcome those for the success of our students. So some of the action items came out were best practices that we were gonna develop, communication across the system to make sure that, because if you remember, 35% of the students who attend Berkeley College will take an online class. So that means there's a percentage of students that need to be educated about online, not just online students that need to be educated about online, but also the other system personnel who are interacting with those students on a daily basis. So when we talk about a system of communication, it's really throughout the entire organization because there's a possibility that every single person that works at Berkeley College is going to interact with a student that's going to take an online class at some point during their career. And as another fun fact, all of our students take their internships online except for our interior design program. Then they're trying to ask me to do that as well but I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, so we had other action items of this retention plan and it was also to uh, recommend the implementation of programs that were going to uh, identify our specific at-risk students and um, unfortunately we came up with some uh, unfortunate data that showed that it was 70% of our students were at risk. So we had, for many reasons, uh, socioeconomic, low uh, academic success in high school, um, remedial courses, more than one remedial course. We have two developmental education reading and writing classes and one uh, transitional math class that we require students to take upon uh, their placement at, in Accuplacer when they come to college and a majority of our students, 60%, 61 I believe it is, they have to take more than one remedial class. So they're already set up for a little bit of a disadvantage. So this committee that was put together, this retention committee, uh, identified the problems and then we also identified solutions that we could apply to those. And then the real fundamental uh, action item of the committee was to really analyze our policies and procedures uh, uh, throughout the system to make sure, again, that they supported the students who took online classes. Other support services that we have for our students at Berkeley College are peer mentors. So all new students and transfer students and students who reactivate back into the system if they've taken more than a year off will get a peer mentor. Um, we have online clubs available for students to enjoy and engage in and they all have either faculty mentors or some functional lead that will be responsible for making sure that current up-to-date useful information is motivational and engaging for them. Um, what isn't on here is upon putting this presentation together uh, when I started about a month ago I realized that we were remiss in having a Hispanic organization and so that went on to another committee. I'm not sure if it's like this at your institutions but I'm on 17 committees, seven of which I chair. And so one of my committees is looking into starting up a Hispanic organization. So we're hoping to uh, launch that uh, sometime in this 2015 year because I, we think it will be something that will be integral to the students' uh, success and motivation, especially online. Um, although all of our student services uh, on the campus are dedicated to our online students, they are also welcome and free to use all of the services that we offer at any of our other locations. So a good portion of our students, and we do have a, a nice percentage base of that, lives within uh, five miles of a Berkeley College campus, so they can also go and get additional assistance on site if they need it. We have personal counseling that's available, and although 
there are times when the personal counseling is perceived as not so much of a negative, our personal are, are perceived as a negative, our personal counselors do a lot of outreach in other areas to demonstrate to the students that counseling can be also about work or academic issues, not just personal issues, which sometimes our, um, ethnic pers our ethnic students are afraid to discuss with someone, especially over the phone. So they're in, they engage in opportunities to uh, to have workshops and webinars with them. We also have librarians. We have uh, library liaisons that are embedded in the courses that do discussion workshops for our students in areas of APA and MLA and also with uh, research and the third one, I avoiding plagiarism. <laughs> and so we also have embedded tutors and embedded academic support center personnel. The embedded tutors are in courses such as finance and accounting and economics, but they're also requested in other courses where students uh, have a propensity to not do well, such as taking an online math class. So statistics and our um, developmental math class also has embedded tutors in those classes. And our academic support center personnel will also engage in discussion workshops in order to assist the students in time management, which we find is a fundamental problem <clears throat> for students, whether they're taking on-site or online classes, but the time management, understanding what they need to do in order to fit the work in during the week as opposed to, <clears throat> excuse me, waiting at the last minute to do their work. So they have multiple types of time management workshops that they do in various classes so that they can help encourage the students to be more successful. And we have tutoring available through a link directly uh, embedded in the, in the Berkeley College Blackboard template. So when the student logs into their class, they have access to directly click on tutoring and they can go right to tutor track, they can make an appointment, they can schedule a uh, time that's convenient for them, which you know is from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., and sometimes later, and they're accommodated because tutor track at least gives you a little bit of a window, and so the personnel that manage that do a really good job of making themselves available to the students. And we also have an online writing lab, which students are encouraged to use, and. I think I mentioned in this slide that we're doing a pilot to test a 100 level course having a requirement that students must submit to the online writing lab. We're having, like most institutions, difficulty expressing the efficacy of not plagiarizing by cutting and pasting what you get from the internet to put it into your discussion board posting or into a paper. So we're trying to get them early in understanding that, uh, what they need to do. Um, so I'm gonna really speed it along because they told me I had 10 minutes, so I was enjoying myself. But so <laughs> with student assessment, we have multiple ways that we assess our students' satisfaction, uh, level of interest, uh, our technology, our effectiveness in instructors' teaching, uh, even in, in whatever technologies we're doing, and it's an annual student satisfaction survey. We also have, for our online classes, every course is evaluated every single year, at least once a year, to determine uh, technology use, multimedia use, effective practices use, so students and faculty are, are asked to evaluate these courses. Um, we also have our faculty at the course level using a mixed model of assessments to determine uh, student uh, understanding of uh, course objectives and learning outcomes. That's a whole grand area, and as you know, when you have as many programs and majors that we have, it's really hard to just give an overview of what any one person is doing in their class, but it is to the discretion of the faculty member to determine the best way to deliver the information, and they are evaluated based on student outcomes. Later on, I think I might show something, but we have an institution-wide um, learning outcomes that are measured in specific courses so that we can determine whether or not students are actually meeting the objectives and the outcomes. Um, so I'll just give a brief example. We have, uh, because I was talking about it last night with Dr. Manny Correa, uh, we have a course called Business Policy and Strategy where there is a major research project that's due. And at the end of the course, um, these 
uh, projects are extracted and then evaluated by an assessment coordinator to determine whether or not we are getting across what we need to to the students. Best practices in technology. This is an interesting one because I, I tried not to touch on the mobile area that I know is coming, but um, right now we use Blackboard in our online classes as our learning management system. And I say right now because one of my jobs uh, and the committees that I have is to always check and see what's out there, what's coming up, and what we need to do to, to um, make sure that we're servicing the students in the best manner possible. So there's other learning management systems, you know, like Moodle and Sakai, Desire to Learn, there's Homegrown, and so we're always looking into those on a yearly basis, but right now we use Blackboard, and our students uh, can, our faculty can use our dynamic rubric maker, which they've really started to use um, very emphatically, and also SafeAssign, which is a module that's built in and uh, it interfaces with Blackboard in order to assess uh, students' learning. We also have some really neat projects going on actually right now as we speak. We have a synchronous learning pilot that we're doing in a public speaking class and we're using Blackboard Collaborate where our faculty member has a uh, one time a week uh, synchronous session with the students to see if that's going to enable them to find more success and satisfaction in the course and hopefully it'll lead to persistence and retention. Uh, as you all know, or may or may not know, uh, public speaking is a very difficult class for some people. They don't do well. They try to take it online so that they can avoid having to stand up in front of people and perspire, you know, and all these other things that happen. But online, they have to actually do presentations. So, you know, we're hoping to walk them through that process. And we're also doing a really cool one with uh, an online accounting lab uh, software that's actually being piloted by one of our accounting faculty. And next quarter, I'm super excited that we're gonna be doing languages online. And so I'm hoping that'll go off without a hitch because if those of you who are aware of how difficult it is to learn how to speak a language, we're gonna try to do it better than Rosetta Stone online. So. <laughs> So in terms of our technology support, we have 24-7 technology support. For the most part, 12 to 14 hours of the day are staffed by Berkeley College uh, employees and then another four hours by part-time Berkeley College employees. It's just the overnights and some weekends that are covered by an external uh, vendor who has, who's trained emphatically in how we want our students to be uh, treated, our faculty and our staff. And then all of our students are required to take Road to Success in Online Learning. It's a course that shows them how to take an online class, and it shows, asks them to demonstrate competency in the functional and technical areas that they might not be so familiar with. Um, yes, yes. Actually, that's another one of the committees that I chair, too. <laughs> Um, we have several committees that meet regularly to discuss these technology needs, when we need Blackboard updates, when we need updates to information that's provided to students and staff and faculty. Um, all three of these I'm on, the Distance Learning Support Committee, Faculty Technology Review Committee, and I chair the Online Chairs Committee. Um, want to speed up? They gave me five minutes. Uh, okay, so promoting quality online. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we have, again, placed uh, in the uh, top colleges for offering online bachelor degree programs at Berkeley College, and we're in the top 100 this year for US News and World Reports. In 2013, we had also um, uh, been awarded USDLA Quality Standards Certification, which is a certification that says we met uh, exceptional criteria in 124 standards, and that was based mostly on our faculty, our technology, our students, our support services, and we're really proud to, every year I have established, I'm chairing that committee as well, uh, so that we can maintain those standards in which we say we promote quality and distance learning. And now there's a new committee, me, for the US News and World Reports to make sure that we, st we stay on top of those things that we say that we do well. And the, the nice thing about the US News and World Reports is it's in our comparison with our peers across the country. So we get to see what other people are doing, how they're doing it, and we even get to reach out and ask them. So I really liked what the, what the uh, president had said about uh, we're gonna copy 
things. We're going to copy and learn from and use somebody else's effective practices to continue to build what we do well. But we have a lot of support that comes out of my office, comes out of the provost office, comes out of the information systems office, and from an online faculty support team that uh, helps the faculty and provides support to them in multimedia and effective practices and technology for our classes. We have many classes that uh, require, all of our classes require a welcome video in the class, but now we're moving to requiring other types of multimedia to aid students' success so that they can be uh, motivated to be successful in their classes. Um, we do have a couple of effective practices uh, that I can mention, and one of them is n all of our faculty are required to go through a very robust 12-week training program, <coughs> excuse me, in order to teach online. They cannot teach online unless they go through that training program. Right now, the training program is facilitated by my office, but I'm really hoping that I'll be able to turn the job over to uh, some of our expert faculty who are uh, good at facilitating uh, training. We also use Quality Matters, Blackboard Exemplary Rubric, USDLA Quality Standards, um, rubrics in order to assist the faculty in understanding what quality in distance education is. And then we encourage our faculty strongly to follow these practices by giving them opportunities to be successful in their classes. Um, we also have Blackboard upgrade, upgrade training almost on a yearly basis that our faculty are required to go through. So when we speak about promoting quality in online classes, we have to talk about the additional follow-up training that goes along with what you're providing. So when our faculty are at the top of their game, you know, the students will be more supported. It's one thing for information systems to understand how something works, but it's another thing when the faculty member becomes the expert in all things online, because they're already the content expert. Um, we have new course development where all of our new courses are required to go through a very, very robust uh, training workshop as they prepare it. They meet with online chairs, other content experts, um, instructional designers, members from my office, so that we can ensure that the best quality is put out there for the students and then that's evaluated immediately the quarter that it's taught and it's also evaluated again on the next time that it's taught again. And then all of our courses go through a quality control check the quarter before they're taught. And much to our faculty's chagrin sometimes, you know, we do catch the occasional, you know, misspelling or wrong quarter. You know, it's really meant for quality control so that the students see that we're expecting the highest quality from our, from our uh, faculty. I've already mentioned our US News and World Report. I think I made it. I did. If you have any questions about any of the information that I've provided to you today, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to provide you with anything that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol, for this interesting presentation of what you're doing very successfully at Berkeley College. And now we will continue with the second presentation by Dr. Juan Tito Melendez, professor at University of Puerto Rico. Dr. Melendez will be sharing his point of view about pedagogy strategies for online courses. Please help me welcome Dr. Tito Melendez. live I'm supposed to talk make sure nobody sleeps okay um, <laughs> uh, as, as an introduction um, I began working with distance education since 1985 um, that puts me with 30 years experience here with distance education uh, all right we're ready okay uh, so I've been asked to reflect on my 30 years dealing with distance education. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, to just think, and at home when I was thinking, my wife would look, make strange comments concerning my staring at the walls for a while. And um, let me see if we got it running here. Okay, good. And I was asked to talk about pedagogical strategies 
during the last 30 years of my life. And when I think back at all the different experiences, and I think back at all the things that we've done in terms of training, it, it's been obvious that there are multiple roads that we can take. There are multiple alternatives that are before us. But I think it's important to have some sort of criteria to establish where we should be going. There should be some sort of criteria to be able to establish what is a better practice and what is a worse practice. And it's easy, and I've lived through this, I've been a participant in this. The famous faculty development programs where you just have a long list of different strategies and it's what I call the supermarket theory of faculty development where you have all these different alternatives presented and the faculty member chooses one. He puts it in this little basket and takes another, puts it in a little basket. And so you have lists like this. You can go onto the internet, you'll find them galore. But the thing is, is, is that where we should be going in terms of just having anybody pick whatever they want and learn whatever they want? I don't think so. Because that reminds me of the little dialogue in, in Alice in Wonderland where, where Alice asks which road to take and she's asked, it depends on where you want to go. And she said she didn't care. And so she was told, well, it doesn't matter which road you take. It, it, it comes to the same situation when we're talking about pedagogical strategies. It's not a question of just taking whatever you want. I think there is a way for us to establish some sort of a route here. And in my 30 years, I've been able to see a fight here, a struggle. I really do. There's a strong struggle going on, still being developed and still developing between traditional practices and practices that we need for the 21st century. It's so easy, it's so easy to just better what we're doing now that's associated with the 20th century. It's so easy and it's really difficult to try and establish programs and try to establish practices that are really in accordance with the 21st century. And I think this is the main battle that we're seeing in education. And as I was thinking back in terms of how to do this presentation, I remember in 1975, that puts us back 40 years, puts me back 40 years. Some of you were born 40 years ago. In 1975, and I want to tell this story, I really do. 1975, I was able to go to this professional conference, and the main speaker was, was Benjamin Bloom. And Benjamin Bloom was talking about mastery learning. And he convinced me, 1975, Benjamin Bloom convinced me that that was the route to go. And it was incredibly clear to everyone there that there's a constant struggle between the constant of time and the constant of excellence. They're both, they both have the possibilities of being a constant, but you can't have both at the same time. Incredibly clear. Either you have a rigid and a constant time span for our semesters and you vary the grading, you vary the excellence, and that's why you have some with excellence A and some with less excellence B, C, Ds, and F. Or you can have just one grade, A, excellence, and you vary the time. It sounded so logical to me. And when you look at this photo here, we know that the kids may start out at the same time, but they'll get to the finish line at different times. Why? Because we recognize that we have different physical abilities. But at the same time, we also recognize as educators 
that we have different intellectual activities, different intellectual cap capabilities. And I'm talking about me, and I, if I was talking about my, my, my hobby with, with co remote control airplanes, I am a, an incredibly bad pilot. Incre I've, I've crashed so many times. And you've got these little kids coming in, you know, with a new plane, and immediately they're flying. And, and I crash, and I crash, and I crash. <laughs> I'm incredibly slow mastering my <laughs> remote control airplane. And the thing is, if we know that we have different time lengths to learn, you say, why don't we have different time lengths for every student to have excellence? A, but our educational system does not work that way. Bloom in 75 convinced me, convinced everybody, but everybody just kept on doing the same thing. So that's why I see this battle and it's a battle when you really get down to it. We're battling against this massive education, which is associated with mass production in the 20th century. We're talking about a rigid education, which is something that is again associated with the 20th century. But then when we look at the technologies that we have, it's so easy to have a personalized and flexible education. The technology is there. We have it. We just don't use it for that. Which means, and I look back, and I'm thinking back about Benjamin Bloom, 1975, how time has just gone by and we've wasted our time. And I know we have a lot of pressures upon us to just keep doing the same thing. But then we look at our country, we look at our students, we look at the youth. Something has to tell us we have to move. And we keep promising students, reach for the stars. We tell them that we need to have a country that's positive. Reach for the stars. But then what do we do? We give them boxes where I have to sit in. And we give them the same treatment to all those students that are filling up those classrooms, filling up those seats. Somehow, what we say is one thing and what we do is another. And when we look at what we promise, we promise the whole nine yards, but we only give them inches. When I look at what's happening with competency-based education today, Everybody's saying, well, we have to go in that direction. We have to make changes in that direction. And then what you see is only changes in the syllabus. And then you look at the practice, the same thing. Ah, oh, no, company says best education. Look at our syllabus. <laughs> Who are we kidding? Something is wrong. And what is wrong is a practice that we've been doing for so many years that doesn't work. We have this faculty-based education, it's teacher-based, you know, we're, we're into instruction. And every time we want to do something, we put a new hat onto our professors. Just keep putting hats on them. Before, they were supposed to be content experts. Then we wanted them to be good communicators. And then you wanted them to be good instructional designers. And then you wanted them to, to have them good with technology. And you want them to have, be really good with evaluation. You keep putting hats and hats and hats on the same people. And eventually, one hat just replaces the other. And you have them doing badly with all their hats. And we've been doing this for years. It doesn't work, but we keep doing it. Incredible. And I think it's based on, if, if you ask me what's the essence of our problem, the essence of our problem is that we have this vision of education, the famous three pillars of education, which is teaching, research, and service. And we base ourselves on that theoretical model, but then we forget we're in the 21st century where a lot of this learning is not taking place in our classrooms. It's not taking place in our institutions. I'm constructing now a quadcopter, okay? And I'm looking at all these videos, and I'm downloading PDFs on how to construct my quadcopter. <laughs> I got to the point where it goes on. It doesn't fly yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> 
the mo motor somehow <laughs> won't turn. <laughs> but I'm learning how to do this with videos, YouTube, downloading PDFs. How many of our students are learning so much outside the classroom, but we don't recognize that learning? Our strategies are still geared toward what that famous professor with 15 hats is supposed to do. Something is wrong with our model. The fourth pillar that we should be thinking about for the institution of the 21st century is an evaluation component. Well, we can just say, hey, tell me what you've learned, and I will certify your learning. Tell me what your competencies are, and I will certify your competencies. Independently of where it was learned, we don't have to compete anymore among our institutions. We can complement each other. We talked about, about, about helping each other out and, and collaborating in the beginning. This is the way to go. When we have institutions that evaluate with rigor, we're not talking about you know, being lax in this, doing it with rigor, but we can do it. It implies looking at our institutions from a different perspective, something we don't tend to do because everybody is just doing the same old thing. And it's because there, everybody has a lot of pressures, and we recognize all the pressures that we have. And it's a question I was saying, well, if there are so many pressures, where are the incentives to be able to innovate? Where are the incentives to be able to do things differently? I don't see this coming from the accreditation institutions. I don't see middle states helping out with innovation. Middle states is complacent if you have some sort of reform, a little patchwork being done. Some sort of change has to be done in the little practices that you have. But you don't see from accreditation perspective a real push for innovation. Nor do you see that from the Council of Education here in Puerto Rico. You don't see that push for innovation. You don't see that push for change. They're complacent. They're very complacent. And that's why we have all these practices that we condemn, but at the same time we foment. <laughs> it's a fascinating article about these test prep factories in China. And here in Puerto Rico, how about these, institu these institutions that give you a high school degree in three months? Huh? <laughs> Two weeks? <laughs> we foment this. Foment this. And now there's a lot of fomentation in terms of research of People who theoretically help you out editing your thesis, what they really do is write your thesis. <laughs> we have this game going on, and everybody's just complacent with the game. I know, I know that change is rough. Many years ago, when my hair was black, I remember, I remember, and I'm trying to think his name. I'm looking at his face. I mean, La, La Borde. La Borde was, at the, he was a chancellor in UMET. Anyway, La Borde? La, La, ba, no. La Barca, La Barca, La Barca, La Barca, La Barca. Yeah. Remember I was in a day-long session with La Barca. And that's one of those workshops where you know, like the, 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 the curtains open up. And he said, hey, Puerto Rico is incredibly good at planning. Puerto Rico is incredibly good in making recommendations. But we are poor in implementing what we've studied. And I know there's a fear to implement. But then we say, my God, where is this country going? Where are our students going? China. China presents an incredible opportunity for us. How is our educational system preparing students to take advantage of the challenge of China? How is our educational system providing opportunities in Africa, a developing continent? Somehow our educational system is not preparing students for this. But, 
and I want to end in a positive note. <laughs> when we look at what's happening, there are people recognizing that good teachers should not be limited to a classroom, but they should be presented to the world. And there are people doing good stuff, and there has to be a way to expand what they're doing. And there are instances where there is a new educational foundation being established. I just hope, I just hope that Puerto Rico and heads institutions could be part of that movement. Thank you. Gracias, Tito. You're always so challenging presentations. <laughs> Stronger than coffee. <laughs> Keep us awake. <laughs> we will conclude, and um, thank you. Uh, please pass yeah, to the table. We will conclude ev the, this event with a question. Uh, excuse me, no. Now we will continue with the third and final presentation by Mr. Edgar Gonzalez. Director of Distant Education at the University of Texas Pan American, who will be provide an overview about mobile technologies. Please help me welcome Mr. Edgar Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Um, I'm trying to get the presentation up. Here we go. So uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Um, like I said, good afternoon, buenas tardes. I also want to welcome the audience listening online, uh, especially my three children. I think they're listening. So Karina, <laughs> Ella, and Alan, if you're listening, I love you. And hello. OK. Wow, what a couple of presentations are going to be tough to follow. So I hope I don't disappoint uh, in this third one. All right, so uh, it's a panel discussion. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in addition just to sharing my experiences in the field of online education and in the context of um, assessment and retention and, and best practices in, in online education and also what technologies, mobile technologies specifically, um, I will just uh, take the approach to try to spark uh, a light just to prompt that Q&A after I finish my presentation. So with that said, uh, and you know, this is, uh, by the way, how will, uh, today is the 15th of January, so Happy New Year to everybody, Feliz Año. Uh, and just as I was preparing to put together this presentation, I ran into this slide right here, in which is from the Educause uh, Review, the online version, and it's for the January, February 2015. And it's the top 10 IT issues for 2015. And if you can see number seven, it's, uh, and it's by the way, titled The New Normal, right? The New Normal, I guess, what's expected. Uh, providing user support in the new normal. Mobile, online education, cloud, and bring your own device environment. So mobile technologies are the new normal. I guess that's what I'm trying to communicate here. And along those lines, you know, I guess just to sh sort of show the new normal, um, these are results from, uh, uh, the EDUCAUSE Center for Analysis and Research. And with regards to mobile technologies, which is what I'm trying to spark here, the conversation of mobile technologies in connection with what Carol and Juan presented, it's, uh, you can see the results here in which uh, the number of users or students who own a mobile device comparing from 2013 to 2015, just two years, or maybe even less, a little less than two years, it continues to grow. Not just the ownership of mobile devices or mobile phones, but also tablets as well. But look at the lighter lines there. Uh, the use of these devices for academic purposes. And if you see what's expected, or the projection for 2015, is 90% of students will have a smartphone, and 58% of the students will have a tablet. And uh, in fact, uh, just last year, in terms of tablets, according to this, to this study, you know, the use for, of tablets for academic purposes intersects with the number of tablets that students have. So in other words, students are, in the beginning they were getting tablets because it was a new device, it was innovative, it was something new. 
but now they're actually getting them with a purpose, for the purpose of using them in the academic setting, so that way they can learn something, right? Now, this is interesting, because this is from the point of view of students. Now, from the point of view of faculty and instructors in the classroom, you can see the policies and practices that faculty have in their classes of the faculty who participated in this survey. You can see that um, there are still instructors and faculty there that they don't allow their students to use their smartphones or their mobile devices in class. Other, uh, fa other faculty members are just, uh, you know, they don't care either way. Uh, if they're there, great. If they're not, that's fine. There's a fewer percentage that encourage the use of these mobile devices, uh, whether it is smartphones or tablets, but look at the difference between laptops and smartphones. Very few percentage require these devices in the class, even though, if I go back to this previous slide, students are acquiring these devices, yes, for the purposes of staying connected, for the purposes of, of doing whatever it is that they need to do in their daily lives, but also for them to actually reach their academic goals, their learning goals as well. So there's a disconnection there. There's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Now, so we're talking about students, we're talking about instructors and faculty. What about higher education institutions? Well, in terms of higher education, we have, uh, in terms of mobile device management, in other words, having a framework, having an infrastructure that it's gonna properly support and facilitate the adoption and use of mobile devices at institutions, you can see that also student, I mean, higher education institutions are way behind. If you see, if you divide everything, 100% uh, of the participants in this survey, the first two lines that are uh, for in place, that institutions that have in place uh, mobile device management processes and procedures, um, it's very small, it's only 10%. Then there's another 16% that are in the process of implementing uh, uh, device, a mobile device management uh, framework or infrastructure. So if you add those up, it's around 26%. That means a quarter of higher education institutions that participated in this survey, they're on the ball. They're, they're uh, you know, keeping pace with what the students' uh, demands and, and, and practices are. The rest are still working, and they still have a lot of work to do to catch up to that. So again, I'm presenting this hopefully to spark a few questions so that we can create a conversation after we get to the Q&A session. All right, now, in terms of students' mobile learning practices. So, oh, one thing that I wanna mention, let me go back over here because I think it's very relevant. Over here, as far as students, and I forgot to mention this, and I'm getting stuck with all these pages right here. Here we go, all right. So. 85% of the students that were surveyed, they list their laptops as the most important device that they use. Then, the next in the list are tablets with 45% of those students, and then smartphones with 37% of the students. Now, I'm starting to feel a little bit out of date. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, going back to saying hi to my kids earlier, well, I have two teenage daughters. They're always on their phone, and to me, at least some years back, the notion of delivering learning through a mobile device to me was, you know, the screen is too little. What am I going to do in this little device? Yet, I see my daughters fully engaged with their cell phones and doing things that I was like, oh man, I, I see how these can take place. I see, I'm starting to connect the dots. And not only that, but the industry kept up and said, you know what, yeah, the screen may be too little for you, so we're gonna make a little bigger device. So the tablet came about, right? So we're going from laptops that in their time was to be mobile, right? Oh, you have a laptop, oh, this is great, you can take it anywhere. To now, laptops are like antiquated, they're humongous, you know, nobody likes to take them anywhere. And in fact, I personally, I went from a 17 inch laptop now to a 13 inch laptop because it's more portable. Even though I thought of cellular phones or smartphones saying, you know, the screen is too small. So anyways, so just wanted to point that out. Okay, let's move forward. So students' mobile learning. Ownership of mobile devices is high among students. And that 
tablets are the most popular device for academic purposes. So this also tells us that students not only have a smartphone, not just a cellular phone, but now they also have a smartphone. And in addition to that, they're seeking to have a tablet as well. Mobile learning usually takes place away from the classroom, you know, independently. You know, going back to my children, my daughters, we have conversations about X topic, X, Y, or Z. It may be an interesting topic to me, and to them, they just roll their eyes at me, which, you know, understandable, teenagers, that's okay. Um, but nevertheless, you know, whenever we're talking about something, sometimes I find them just looking at their phone on their own, away from the dad, or the mom, because they don't want to know that, you know, they want to tell you, I'm not interested in what you're saying, because I'm a teenager, so I'm going to rebel. But if you still catch their, their attention, they're going to go and check it out on their own, independently, away from the conversation. Well, that same setting, that same type of behavior takes place in the classroom in the context of mobile learning. We can have a conversation today, and in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if either right now or earlier during the meetings, a topic came up that it was of interest to you or an idea came up and either you text somebody or you send an email to somebody through your mobile device. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, sometimes the, the mobile learning takes place independently and without the guidance of instruction. So it acts sort of like as a complement to it. And then mobile learning also helps to improve the effectiveness of teaching and learning. Students and instructors need help adopting more e effective learning and teaching practices across content areas. Why? Because we got to take advantage of these. Or if not take advantage, at least we got to stay and keep pace with what the expectations of the students, of this new generation of students are. Okay, so how do students actually use mobile learning? Or how, how do this mobile learning takes place uh, for students? So, this is a 2013 Speak Up survey. Now, this survey is for K through 12 schools, but the reason why I'm sharing it with you, even though we're higher education institutions, is just to show you what's on the pipeline of the number of students or the students that are gonna be coming up to higher education institutions and what they are going to be there expecting from these institutions. So, 60% of the students are using mobile devices for any time research. And I have an example about this, actually. Something hit me, and I was making a note as I was listening to these conversations earlier, and then also just, uh, just to put it in a relevant context to you. Um, earlier today in the board meetings, we, were, we had the opportunity, oh my goodness, 10 minutes, I'm, I, I gotta hurry up. We had the opportunity uh, to hear from students who have now a presence in, in the HEADS organization. This is great. And some of the things that they share with us, it was fantastic. So that's one thing. So we have student participation in HEADS. Later on, as part of another report, we also saw the number of access to HEADS resources from mobile devices skyrocketing. You know, to me, it's no coincidence that now there's more student participation with the HEADS organization and the number of accesses through mobile devices. It's no coincidence. There's a relationship between those two. 43% of students use their uh, cellular phones or their mobile devices or tablets for educational purposes. My youngest son, he's nine years old. He's always, in fact, we gotta keep him away from the, from the tablet. But there's so many games that are actually, well, I guess maybe it's a psychological thing that I feel much better as a parent that I'm letting him use an electronic device and he's actually learning something. Uh, whereas before, when I was growing up with the Atari and, you know, and the Nintendo, my parents didn't want me there all the time because it was just games. But at least here, I feel a little bit better that it's, uh, you know, either the multiplication tables or whatever that may be. So anyways, all right. 40% uh, of students use uh, their mobile devices for collaboration. And I go back, you know, I did that earlier today. As part of the conversation in the meetings, I actually used my iPad to send an email to somebody about an idea that came up. 33% um, of the students surveyed use mobile devices for reminders, alerts related to their academic lives. So even a text message saying, you know what, your assignment is due tomorrow, that's very beneficial for students, especially those students where time management is still a challenge for them that are coming in as freshmen into college. That's critical for them as well. 24% uh, of them use it for taking photos. 
as part of the assignments or just creating content. One of my daughters, I don't know if you've heard of vines. They're just very short, small videos. She creates a lot of vines. I can see how you can putting together best practices in pedagogy, putting together also an assessment mechanism on how to evaluate the learning. You can ask your students as an assignment on how to create a short video to show a competency, speaking of competency-based learning, a competen that they've mastered a competency. So, you know, and 80% of those use it for in-class polling as well. All right, so moving on. So mobile technologies improve learning. How do they improve learning? Inquiry-based learning. During lunch, you Belkis, you were mentioning about that La Placita, home, one of the places to go here, right? Well, right away, I pull out my cell phone, I Google La Placita. Now I know what to expect when I go later today with my wife, so thank you. <laughs> Inquiry-based learning, just not just taking place right now, today, outside the classroom, but also for students as well. When your teenage daughters, they want to challenge you on something, well, they pull out their cell phone, they Google things, just to try to keep you on your toes. Um, all right, flip classroom. You can ask your students to look at something in their mobile devices or for them to create something in their mobile devices so that when we get together, instead of me lecturing you as a student, we actually communicate, we engage with each other, and it goes back to not just doing the same thing over and not just changing the syllabus and doing the same practices, but rather doing something different about it as well. Reinventing the textbook. If I was on a trip and I wanted to take my textbooks back when I was going to school, I needed to take a humongous backpack, right? Now I can just take a tablet, and if there's eBooks or PDFs or whatever it is, I can just take it anywhere. Breaking gender barriers. So HEADS focuses on Hispanic students. There are other groups of students in which perhaps it's gender-based, who can or who cannot have access to formal education. Well, now the market penetration on mobile devices is such that they don't need to go somewhere to get an education. You can leverage a mobile device to deliver education to those people regardless of their gender, regardless of their disabilities. You know, sometimes if for, for people who have extreme disabilities, they need to, instead of going somewhere, you can bring the instruction to them. Continuous learning, the quadcopter. You mentioned that you looked at YouTube videos, right? So. What I picture in my mind when you were describing that is that you probably have a working area where you have all the different pieces. Well, imagine if you're trying to do that, and then you gotta walk over to where the old dinosaur computer is in a desk away, and then you look at the video there, and then you gotta come back, and then you forget, and it's like, let me go look at the video again. But now, if I'm in the working area, and I take out my cell phone or my mobile device, I can just set it up there, play it, put the piece together, and then that's, I guess, even though it's very simple, very minimal, but that's how mobile devices can improve the learning for students as well. Okay, so I gotta move forward because I'm running out of time. I guess I'll just end with this. It's not just mobile learning, and what I would like to make the case here, I have a few more slides, but, but this is the important one. It's about fluid learning. So in other words, it's not about you got to use your mobile device to teach and to learn for the sake of using it, but rather you got to use your mobile device as a component or as just one element to deliver the instruction and to make instruction relevant and engaging to your students. So that way, going back to this right here, whatever content is that you are designing, delivering, whatever learning you want it to take place, there's gotta be neutrality so that it's accessible whether it is through the computer, through a laptop, through a tablet, or through a mobile phone. There's gotta be granularity so that you can chunk it in such a way that it's going to be effective, whether it is you're using a small screen on a smartphone or a desktop computer that you go to a computer lab. It's gotta have portability, of course, and not portability in the sense that you can take it anywhere, but in the sense that it's got, I, I, I put the, the example that there of Evernote. I love that program. You know why? I can use it on a web browser, I can use it on my cell phone, I can use it on my tablet, I can use it anywhere. 
And Evernote, you just think of it as a basic text editor in which when I have an idea, I go there, I type that idea, and I have it there. And it doesn't matter if I just have my phone or if I'm in the office uh, being able to access the. So that portability is what I'm talking about. Interactivity, this is not just for mobile learning, not just for online education, for traditional education as well. You gotta have that engagement, that interaction between student to student, student to instructor, but also student to content as well. Ubiquity, this one is the one that really gets me going. Because learning and, and, and materials, they gotta be, you gotta create, or they, they gotta be present, but beyond the classroom. They gotta be relevant. They gotta be present in the context of your professional life, so that I'm gonna make sense. Why am I learning this? Why am I doing these exercises if I want to be a rocket scientist? So, but if you put it in context so that students can connect, well, you're doing this because this is going to help you to make sure that your rocket doesn't explode in the middle of the, uh, of the launch, then that makes sense. So, you know, learning beyond the learning spaces, be present in relative settings and context. The workplace, the learning space, and I use there, for example, of museums. If I go to a museum, I can, if there was an app that I can just scan a barcode, a, 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 a barcode, and then out of that is gonna give me some information about the piece that is being displayed, you know, that would make it, a, for me, a lot more relevant wherever it is that I'm being. So, with that said, you know, I hope I didn't disappoint after these two great presentations, but I hope also that we can put all of this together and have a great conversation, uh, create a community of inquiry, and then go from there. I believe there's a question in the back. So thank you. Gracias, Edgar. Thank you very much. And we will conclude this event with a question and answer session. It is important that you use the microphone located along the room. It's right there. Uh, and introduce yourself, saying your name, uh, and also saying the name of your institution and your questions and for whom is it. Again, participants watching this event through the internet can send their questions via email to heads, info, excuse me, info at heads.org to participate as well. We have two people from our staff uh, looking for those questions to give it to uh, our moderator so they can do your question and be answered uh, live. But, but first, please welcome President Gloria Vaquero, who will be the moderator of this part. Gracias, thank you. I just want to remind everybody that retention and assessment are two of the three main goals for HEADS, the other one being access. So we want to be sure that we give access for education for all the Hispanics and a lot of, and a lot of other groups. But we need to, to be sure that those students are learning, are becoming better persons, better citizens. So we need to be asking those questions when we discuss and we ask the questions. What are, what are, we, what are we getting out of that education we're giving to the students, no matter if this is on ground or online? So HEADS is, is involved in three goals, retention, assessment, and access to education. So when we do the assessment of that education, the student, that those things that the students are learning, been learning in the course or in the program the, when they finish because the retention is the completion. Are they, be, you know, completing the, the program, the course, the four years, the six years, the degrees? What are they getting? What are they good at? So we heard Carol saying the, the online education has a lot of challenges. Yes, it does because it's very different but they, are, they need to learn how to be a better person, a better citizen, are we getting that? And then Tito is telling us we are not doing it, we are not getting it, he's scaring us. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. No, no, it's not just on ground, in a manera presencial or just online, we're not, we're not doing it the right way since 1975. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Edgar presents present us and other strategies. Uh, are we getting better citizens just in the phones, in the tablets, just in the computer? 
what about the, the communication, the relationships, how to relate each other, is it good to be with that phone? So it's, it's created me a lot of questions. So I know that you, all of you have a lot of questions too. So who wants to start? Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jorge Negron. I'm president of Columbia Central University. Uh, I, I find all presentations fascinating and full of information, but I'd like to address my, my question to the last presenter uh, regarding uh, mobile learning. Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating what you presented because I see the kids using those mobile things every single day, constantly. Now, in a classroom setting, where do you draw the line? to avoid them being distracted from what is being presented. That's my concern. Thanks. And, you know, there's, there's no silver bullet that it's going to address that, but what I would, the approach, the general approach that I would take, it would be to first embrace that technology. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, and going back to the slide where I show how even some faculty forbid the use of smartphones in the class. Well, going back to doing things differently from what Dr. Juan said, uh, and also having a, a framework like Carol was sharing in her presentation about assessing and putting together using best practices, uh, a sound instructional design framework that it's going to allow professors to embrace the mobile devices and do it in such a way that rather than distracting the students, they can use it to contribute to a conversation or even, uh, I'll give you an example, the, the, the term back channeling, in which um, even today, well the group is fairly small, but uh, put yourself in a conference where there's hundreds of attendees in the opening keynote session. Some of them, you're gonna have a wide spectrum, right? You're gonna have the ones that are going to be listening to every single word, getting all excited about whatever it is that they're talking. You're gonna have the other group that are gonna be like, well, been there, done that, or I don't care about this topic. You're gonna have people somewhere in between. And if you have, let's say, some people that you can actually bounce ideas or make a comment, whether it is not about like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the tie that the presenter is using is not pretty at all. No, nothing like that, but rather, you know, I disagree or I agree with whatever it's being shared. So putting a strategy or an activity or, or embracing that and, and put the different pieces together, then I think that's where you don't necessarily need to draw the line, but rather you are going to set things up so that these mobile devices will act as another way of doing things different. Constantly, they're constantly testing their boyfriend or girlfriend or, or friend, and, and it's a constant thing, and I, I see it done all, every day. So that's what I'm talking about. How, how do you distract them from that and bring it into the classroom to engage with the, uh, the subject matter? Yeah. Can I just answer? Yeah. I'd like to speak to that. Mm -hmm. How did you um, address a student who fell asleep in your class? I've had students sleep in my class, and they shouldn't be because I'm extraordinarily engaging. <laughs> it hurts my ego. Yeah, right. and it, that relates it, to training. You were talking about the how to train that teacher it, to deal with that. It really is. It really is about supporting the faculty because, first of all, mobile devices, laptops, 
anything, it's not applicable to all classes. The flipped classroom isn't applicable to all classes. We have to realize that you have to look at what the effective practices are and really demand training from your CELT, whatever you want to call it, ours is the teaching and learning commons. You really you need to demand from your president or your provost some type of faculty training that's going to address and then have some type of support for system-wide policies that are going to support you in the classroom. Because this came up, what, when I started teaching 15 years ago, a student asked me, why aren't you using PowerPoint in the classroom? I'm like, well, today I'm teaching sociology. I use PowerPoint when I teach business. But here it's sociology, and I want you to get in groups. It, it doesn't, it's not always applicable. So you have to really, it took me seven to 10 years to be able to explain to students what my instructional strategy was, what my teaching methodology was, what did I expect in the classroom, and what should I expect from them when they came into the classroom? And that is related to assessment. What, is what, what we need to teach, what they're supposed to learn, how we're going to assess that. So we have to keep the faculty in control of those processes. And, and you also have to remember, excuse me, I'm just sorry. sorry. You also have to remember, you're not responsible for their learning. They are. Okay. So you can't be upset. It took me... 10 years to not feel pained when a student didn't do well in my class. I'm like, I'm here, I'm doing everything, just like everyone else is. Finally, it took me too long time, I was like, well, you know, I'm doing everything I can, so what part do you expect from them? So if so-and-so is texting her boyfriend and she misses what's going on, you know, you have some gentle conversations like, yeah, that sounds like fun, I like to text my wife too, you know, or you say something, you know, but you, you put, the, put the onus back on them. Hey, John, you wanted to add something? Uh, I was just going to say also, going back to what Juan mentioned, how faculty are being asked to wear different hats. That was a great <laughs> picture, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, and this is also putting my instructional designer hat. Okay. Um, instructional design, and the faculty does, doesn't necessarily need to, to come up with all of these, but an instructional design can help mitigate some of those challenges. But yeah, there's not much you can do for those that are not in, that are not motivated to begin with. So you know, there's that, and they gotta take ownership and responsibility for their own learning, like Carol said. Another question? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Tomas Morales uh, at uh, California State University in San Bernardino. So this question is for all the panelists, but I'd like Carol to, if you could lead. Um, so there are two issues uh, that we struggle with uh, in terms of online learning, and you touched on on them. One is um, how, how do you, where's the evidence of learning? How, how, what, what's the Um, okay, yes, two really good questions. I'll start with the evaluations. Um, two times a year we ask our students to evaluate all the classes, whether they be on site or online. And so they can fill out an anonymous survey that asks them about the learning, the amount of time they spend uh, studying or preparing for a class, the perceptions of their satisfaction. Um, really. All of the, quali the quantitative evidence is really good, but what really comes down to is the, the qualitative comments that the students make. So when a student says, even in a conversation with me, that professor is really hard, uh, they, that professor doesn't like me, uh, it's never, it's because I only put 20 minutes into the class or because I missed seven weeks of class or because it's never anything that they do. So. We really look at perceptions a lot and try to individualize the results for them by addressing what their concerns are. You're working, you're a single parent, you work a second job, daycare is a problem. You know, you really have to get everyone at the, at the micro level. So when we evaluate students, it's the, if you want the process, it's through uh, a survey that's administered through an institutional effectiveness. 
And so our inter institutional effectiveness office will email the students directly and ask them to fill out a survey two times a year that asks them various questions. And right now we're go we also do NESI and FESI, if you're familiar with those, uh, so we can compare ourselves, but we also do one that we designed ourselves for our own internal. Uh, now, if you're talking about measuring a student's uh, learning, as you well know, the faculty is responsible for grading those things that, those items that come in to their particular class. So we hire content experts who are credentialed and we give them training and professional development opportunities and effective practices and we push, you know, a lot of effective practices, but at the end of the day, when Dr. Manny Correa says that uh, Carol Smith earned a C, I, I have reason to believe that, that Carol Smith earned a C. So how do we move that forward? You know, you move it with alignment in your program, retention, uh, graduation, uh, job placement. At Berkeley College, we specifically, our mission talks specifically about making students, I mean, so embarrassed I don't know exactly what the mission statement is exactly, but it's we prepare students for employment in the real world. So we want to, like the president said, prepare them for scenarios that they're not yet mm -hmm. prepared to undertake. It isn't just an academic scenario, it's getting yeah, yeah. to work on time, being properly dressed, speaking appropriately. So we have to make the faculty member wear many hats to teach these things along the way. So we're looking at a lot of different things as the student moves through. We have institution-wide outcomes assessment. So by X period of time, all of our students at the end of their freshman year should be able to, accept, to do these competencies. And if they're not able to do these competencies, we have to go back and look at the process. So you're talking like it's year after year after year of you know, the assessment, the, the review, and then the, the follow-up. So it's just, it's a continuous process because you wanna be able to get these students to where they're gonna be successful in the workplace and taking over for those who are going to be leaving the workplace. Mm -hmm. Did okay. I answer your question? No, follow-up. The only follow-up I, I would have is that, you know, typically, um, you know, I, I've, I've served on the WASC commission. I, I, I've been very involved with Middle States when I was at the College of Staten Island. And, you know, typical faculty response, well, I give a midterm and a final, and that's how I assess the students. You and I both know that that's not acceptable to regional accrediting bodies. They want to see, well, what is the evidence that you have? Some institutions in a communications or speech course would, would film freshmen uh, at an uh, uh, introductory course and then film the students in a capstone uh, uh, course when they're seniors to see what's the transformation, what's the learning that took place in a particular program, like, like speech, for example. Uh, so that, that's the question that I really, and I'm on an, in an online environment, um, how do you create the evidence so that when you go through an accrediting process, you can say, we know that, or we've given the grade to a student, we know that Basically, it's the same for the face-to-face. -face. We are supposed to have the, the old objective and learning outcomes. It's the same requirement. Well, we ha it's difficult to demonstrate it online, but the Blackboard and all the LMS systems provide for that. But we have to show evidence that the students complete everything that was asked. How do you okay. use that? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think one of the, the great attributes of competency-based learning, it, it, it's basically composed of three aspects. One is defining what are the competencies that we want our students to have. And, and that definition doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't come from, from academics. Should come from civil society, should come from professional organizations, should come from outside the ivory tower in terms of what are the competencies that we want our students to have. And, and that forcing of the dialogue between the institution and professional organization is, is an important dialogue. 
The second aspect is how do we prove that those competencies are met? Mm -hmm. And so evidence is, is a key aspect of competency-based education. You have to have the evidence. And that evidence also should be dialogued, and it doesn't come from academia and the ivory tower either. This is something that should be discussed with professional organizations and with civil society. The third aspect is how do we help our students construct the evidence? And that turns into the main format for instructional, uh, for instructional strategies. How do we help our students construct the evidence and how do we evaluate the well construction of that evidence? That's why a competency-based education forces us to answer these questions. And when it comes to accreditation, accreditation has to get in, and, and, it's, and it's going in that direction, defining qualities of, of evidence between direct and indirect. And, and we know that indirect is not as good as direct. We know that exams are indirect, and we know that construction of projects is much more powerful. How do we do that online? It's the same type of problem that you have in traditional education. It's time consuming. This is not something that you do from one week to the other. There's a, there should be a link inclusively between one course and another course. Students should be able to construct big projects, long-term projects, but that means having professors talk to each other, having programs dialogue, and have them really have major, major discussions, which is not what you usually see in academia. Uh, and I'll just add, um, so there's three key words out of these, or the way that I would aim to answer that question. Three <coughs> key words. One is alignment, the other one is measurement or measurable, and then the other one is commitment. So let me backtrack. So going back to, and, and you mentioned 30 years in online education, so that's young adulthood for online education, if you will, right? So we are reaching a mi milestone in online education in which we have to redefine and rethink the overall direction, if you will, of online education. And there's plenty of research opportunities now in, in the scholarship of teaching and learning in an online setting. And that, thank goodness, the popularity of that is going up because those questions that you are asking, the only way and the proper way to answer those questions is through research. Uh, but, so going back to measurable, right? And going back to competency-based. Fill in the blank, you can say competency-based, online education, or traditional face-to-face -face education. You gotta really define what is it that you are trying to accomplish as a program. That means faculty talking, like Juan said, with each other, not in silos, not my course is the best, and I'm one of the top leaders in research in this area, and therefore everybody's beneath me and I'm not gonna talk to anybody, no. It's making the commitment uh, which is the other keyword, in which faculty administrators will make the commitment to put that time and effort to talk to each other to define a measurable learning outcome, whether it is at the program level, program goals, or even at the course level, and then the alignment that needs to take place so that those assessment mechanisms will align properly so that going back to what you said, well, I just give them a midterm and a final exam and it's a multiple choice, and if you are, let's say, in a discipline where nursing, well, or pharmacology, in which you actually wanna make sure that they do things right, because otherwise they can actually kill a patient, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wanna make sure that those assessment instruments and mechanisms align properly with those measurable learning goals and objectives but it requires a lot of commitment, a lot of cost, because there's a lot of time and effort that needs to be invested, and patience. All of these sounds very nice when we're talking about it, but actually doing that, it's very difficult and challenging in the setting of academia today, so. I just, you want to I just have one thing. Do you ask that question of your on-site learning? Yeah. Okay. And so, what is the result of your question? Yeah, I mean, this is a major challenge. I mean, when you talk about alignment, um, when I talk to department chairs, 
oftentimes they say that we have a hard time getting all the faculty to come to one department meeting per month. So when you talk about alignment in a particular program, uh, nursing, for example, or biology, you want to make sure that biology 100 has learning outcomes that prepares the student for biology 101. Correct. That prepares students for biology. One, and we all have developed, you know, a matrix with specific learning outcomes. And we know that um, higher education is still in its infancy, I, I would say, if you talk to regional accrediting bodies or other AACSB or disciplinary accrediting bodies, we have not really embraced the faculty, the importance of, of an evidentiary approach to assessment. So I am very, very supportive of online instruction I ask the same question, whether it's chalk and talk or whether it's online. That's great. Okay, m maybe move to another question, yes. Hi, Eduardo Martí, interim president of Bronx Community College. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, really. High quality and, and very professional, thank you. There are two presentations, I think, that are going concurrently uh, in what you were talking about. One is the fact that there is such a thing as an online, you know, asynchronous course that you, you take at your own pace with competency-based methodology. Uh, I was very interested in that part because I am not familiar and I learned a lot in terms of the support services that are provided for students who are taking as asynchronous courses. I was very much interested also in the use of mobile technology. And, uh, and, and it really opened up my eyes when you're talking about students talking to their girlfriends or boyfriends as they're going to class. Well, they used to do that when I was in grammar school with little pieces of paper that we would pass, <laughs> pass around. So it's just, it's the same process, it's just using a different technology. Different medium, yeah. That's but, correct. But if we make an, a, a, a comparison between a piece of paper and, and a pencil, and a mobile device, we have uh, requirements for basic communication skills with pencil and paper. And yet, we are now entering a phase where the mobile device use may be something that is akin to writing pencil and paper. So how do we assure that all the students are, who are in the class, who are using mobile devices, have the same capability, or similar capabilities, I should say, of using the mobile device. Some kids know how to use it very well, others do not. And if we use that in the classroom, uh, you know, and, and we assume that everybody has the same competency, I think we're making a mistake. So in the future, are we gonna have remedial classes as to how to use a mobile device before you can enter a particular class? We go back to the learning and assessment aspect of what we are discussing. Anybody, okay, so, so one of the slides that I jumped over because I was running out of time, but, but mm. um, you know, uh, I'll read it to you. By 2025, mobile natives, meaning students born after the first Apple iPhone was released, uh, will be entering higher education, bringing with them an era of mobile learning, so that's one. The other one, if you will, uh, going back to the slide that I show higher education institutions, what they were doing with regards to mobile learning, and some of them are behind, part of that mobile device management or part of that infrastructure is also, just like we did in the past when computers were more available and accessible for everybody, to start even as part of the core curriculum to offer computer literacy classes, we may need to consider strategies such as those. So that's one. Um, having said that, though, uh, you know, even uh, um, there's a lot of users that have grown with mobile devices that at some point it's going to be not an issue, but in the meantime, we gotta bridge that gap from the today to the then when we get to that point. And part of that requires going back to the slide, like I said, of higher education institutions, having a proper infrastructure. The new normal, the very first slide, hello, top 10 IT issues of 2015. 
that's one of the challenges that all higher education institutions will need to think because that's the new normal. It's here, it's happening, and something needs to be done about it in order for our students to be successful or to have an environment where they can be successful. So it's, it's uh, one of those $64 million questions, and if I had the answer, you know, I would be, yeah, I, exactly. I do, have a, I do have a comment to that, President. Um, again, for me, it goes back to the training and support of faculty. You know, the students, they're here to learn. So by default, they're going to, you know, they're going to let us know what their is issues are. We have students at Berkeley College who, for whatever reason, their computer breaks and we don't find out till three, four weeks later. And then they're like, well, I don't have a computer. Okay, well, let's see what we can do to help you out because we don't want to put you at a disadvantage. Or we canceled a class on site that only had two students enrolled in it. So those two students at the Westchester campus now have to take their class online. Well, they don't own computers. How are they going to take an online class without a computer? You know, it's really about, you know, the education, the pro providing support to staff and faculty to be able to identify these needs. And we do put a lot, at Berkeley College, we put a lot of responsibility. Not hats, but I like this. I'm going to start adopting this. We put a lot of responsibility on our faculty who teach online. I'm going to say this out loud, but I said, I don't want to teach for Berkeley College online because you <laughs> I ask the faculty to do so much stuff. You have to be a trainer. You have to be an educator. You have to be a content expert. You have to be a technology person. You have to be a personal counselor. You have to be an advisor. You have to, you know, there's a lot of roles and responsibility that they have to play, you know, and that's what we expect at Berkeley College. We expect that every student that comes in is not just a number, they're not just a name, they're someone that we want to be successful. So everybody has to be actively in, in, ingratiated in their success, which means said faculty member might have to learn how to use, teach using a mobile device, or teach with a tablet, or teach with a using the flipped classroom because that's what's best for their class, or it's really about the education and you know training of the personnel that work in the institution and communicating that it's the supporting of students. Another co question for the audience? Yes. I'm Mike Kress, I'm the Vice President for Technology at the College of Staten Island. I have two questions. One I think is a very hard question uh, and the other is pr probably less difficult. So the first question is, have you thought about the implications of measuring college preparedness in light of some of the new ideas of fluent learning, for example, online learning? I mean, uh, when we look at uh, the, the test in and out of remediation, this, this model that's been going on for a very long time. So I'd like to get some thoughts about how you may see that changing or not changing. <coughs> the second question is, is pretty simple, uh, I think, but more uh, operational, and that is, um, what do you see as the role of the colleges in preparing the use of mobile devices, iPhone-like devices, rather than laptops? And how, how do you see that role evolving? Would you like to you start? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, I forgot the first question, <laughs> but I'm going to go with the second one. Okay, so the second one, uh, as far as mobile devices, um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, okay, um, I mean, a little embarrassed that I forgot the first question. So going back to the, to the second question. Um, the first one is about college preparedness. Oh, excellent, okay, so then let me, let me go back to you that one. There that are instruments, the there are mechanisms, and in mm -hmm. fact, there are actually companies out there that focus on providing mm -hmm. assessment instruments for your students so they can become more aware of what their strengths and weaknesses are as they become college students. Now, the culture, in my opinion, is not so widespread across higher education that these type of instruments are being leveraged and put into the whole process, in a, uh, put into a streamlined process so that as, as uh, students become part of a university, uh, that would be part of the process of them being matriculated or being, you know, moved from, uh, you know, a 
just like being advised, you know, you are required to go through advisement if you want to progress through your higher education institution or through your higher education career. Uh, maybe, for instance, just thinking out loud here, uh, you know, if you want to take an online course and you're a freshman, let's, before we get to that, take this assessment, you find out where your weaknesses and strengths are, and then based on that, we'll point you to different resources that we have in our university, whether it's a writing center for, for your writing skills, uh, even reading skills, or time management, all these different components that make a successful online student uh, to be able to, to, to accomplish his or her goals. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think, in general, speaking in general terms, mm -hmm. higher education institutions with regards to online education, we don't have a process in place that it's sort of like automatic, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, 24 hour support for online students. Like, you know, you gotta have that. You gotta have uh, uh, internet connection if you wanna participate in an online course. So those are, hello, duh, that's basic, right? So the goal is to have something basic, like you wanna take an online course, duh, you gotta first go through these kind of process. So that's, that's to answer question. In regards to the second one, which is mobile technology and all of that, uh, higher education institutions need to embrace this and get on the ball and figure out how to address all of that. So that way, for instance, for every, whether it is the institution providing an iPad, if you're gonna be our physician's assistant program at our university, when they are accepted into the program, they're given an iPad. Because the program itself created an iBook in which it has anything from how to be successful in the program to actual documents, textbooks, and materials that they're gonna need as they go through it. So they need to embrace that, they need to put a, a framework and an infrastructure to facilitate that and to support that. So I guess in short, I don't wanna take over. And so the university yeah. pays for the internet access when it uses? Is the university paying for the internet access and uses of the? No, now no. hopefully so we'll get also to the point that it's gonna be like, oh, everybody the student, needs they to don't have, have internet Money for the internet. Yeah, yeah. While he's getting set up, <laughs> I just <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's important for us to, to look at history. Uh, if we look at the history of, of institutions of higher education, institutions were elitist institutions. Uh, they were institutions for a minority. They were institutions that didn't care about retention because they wanted mm -hmm. students to drop out to have only that elite involved. But what happens then is that we evolve these institutions involved and students in masses begin to attend institutions of higher education and the institutions have not been able to really adapt to a mass higher education. And why has that been? Because we're still very, very conservative. We used still don't have institutions that really have a good assessment from the beginning. We don't have that. It, because it wasn't there before. It's something that should be done now, but institutions still haven't got, grasped that on the one hand. On the second hand, if we look at reality, nobody here, nobody here has taken a course on how to use an iPhone. Nobody here has ever taken a course on how to use a tablet. One thing is using the technologies that are very common on the one hand, as a student, because basically it's touching and sliding across the screen. The other thing is preparing that content, which is a whole different scene altogether. We're talking about two different scenes here. And what, again, what I criticize, what some see as positive is having the professor with multiple hats. I see it as very negative. Um, but the thing is, is that we have this reality that we have to deal with where institutions have to understand we're in the 21st century. You have Obama talking about free, free community college education because of the need for massivity of higher education. So we're talking about new scenarios which the institutions still haven't grasped. Because it means if we do that, to have it massive, you have to have good evaluations from the beginning, have an understanding of where the gaps are 
to be able to deal with those gaps on a multiple level. And many institutions are not prepared to deal with the gaps on the multiple level because they're offering courses. And they're not offering gaps in other areas such as time management, which is so important for students. Institutions still haven't understood their role in the 21st century. I've long since forgotten the question, so I apologize. <laughs> would you, would <laughs> <laughs> Sir, would you mind repeating the first one? I thought it was really interesting. With understanding uh, college preparedness and remediation, I mean, I'm sure that there's mm -hmm. every one of our institutions deals with remediation at some level. So how does that look in the world of fluent education when we start looking at learning outcomes that may not be about whether or not you learn Chaucer? I, you know, I can't answer that in, in its entirety because I work, I used to work very extensively with um, high schools back in the day at a former institution in a former life. And I see that the students coming through are coming through with less and less academic competencies. And that is why I see today that our students are needing remedial courses more than they needed 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And I think that um, we'll never stop needing uh, to educate the students on things that are around them and exposing them to Chaucer or Shakespeare or global social change or gender race in class or any of those things because I think it legitimately makes them a, a, a well-rounded student. Um, probably the best story that I have that can explain this is my mother's a retired RN with a two-year RN degree from a community college. Uh, she failed an entire semester of courses because she had a ninth grade education, um, you know, she raised a family, uh, you know, my parents divorced, um, you know, I put my mother through that college when I was 16, so she went to uh, do her RN degree, and when she failed and she was really depressed, you know, I remember her telling me, she's like, I'm a really good nurse, I love to work with people, I can do these things. My mother is a genius when it comes to phlebotomy, and catheters and all sorts of stuff, but academically, she, ca she came from a very unprepared background, you know, so going to school in her 30s, she didn't know how to study, she didn't know how to in get in there, but you know, she got back in there, she passed with, the, with the, the lowest grade you could possibly get to be a nurse, but it didn't negate her competency to do the job. You hear all the time they pass lawyer, the lawyers pass the bar, you know, at the, the lowest score possible, but they become lawyers. You know, so I think we've been hearing this and dealing with this for, that was 25, 30 years more ago when my mother, I'm trying to think when my mom went to school, you know, and I keep that story in my mind when I deal with the students because I realize they don't come with the competencies. It's our job to help them, you know, to be able to, to be in the workplace, to be a productive, I mean, what was that, you know, to be a productive member of society and the workforce. So I think as long as we have people like you and I that are asking that question, we'll always try to come up with mannerisms and ways to, to address that. But it's always, I think it's always going to be there. El gran reto educativo ¿verdad? que tenemos de cómo preparamos una mejor sociedad, siendo la educación a distancia un medio para lograr esas competencias de esos seres que tenemos ahí. Es un reto para la enseñanza en el salón y es un reto para la enseñanza a distancia. Es el mismo, es el mismo problema histórico que hemos tenido. Tenemos el tiempo para una pregunta adicional, no de question, we have time for that. Thank you. Uh, Carlos Vargas from Goodstown University. Um, let me start by saying, by sharing with you some of the challenges that we face at my institution uh, with respect to uh, uh, the initiative on, on distance education. That is that um, the, the faculty uh, collective bargaining agreement that we have, and that's where my question is going to go, because you have some private institutions, some public institutions, but the collective bargaining agreement does not allow uh, us to uh, uh, 
uh, essentially impose on a faculty member a, an online course for teaching. Uh, this is a voluntary activity that the faculty member uh, takes. And, and so what we find is that the, uh, the disposition of the faculty is very critical. Um, faculty that are more senior uh, may not be as comfortable uh, with the new technologies as, as the students are, or even as the, as the junior faculty that we have. So, we've, so the, the change comes very slowly as a result of that. And um, the other thing, too, that we have a, a challenge with is that uh, the classroom uh, environment is not subject to the ability of uh, others to, to monitor. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the faculty member has absolute control inside the classroom. Uh, in terms of the assessments that are done of the students. Um, and uh, I, for example, I'm not allowed to even visit a classroom unless I am invited by the faculty member. Uh, if I want to teach a course, which I have, I have to ask uh, the faculty union for permission uh, to, to offer that course. So one of the questions that I have is how, in particular, Professor Melendez probably has more you know, how do, how do you go about uh, speeding up that process of change in the faculty other than perhaps through uh, retirement? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm trying to think now how long it was that we did the study on innovation in higher education in Puerto Rico. I think it's about eight years, eight years ago. We did a study sponsored by the, the, the Council of Higher of Higher Education. I criticize them a lot, but then again, they have sponsored some really good research. It's a contradictory relationship that we have. <laughs> it's a love hate relationship. <laughs> um, but one of the things that that innovation theory has has presented uh, many times, uh, innovation has to be presented has to be developed outside of the current. And again going back when my hair was black and, and I would attend di distance education conferences, I remember a lot of distance education programs were continuing education programs. And that's where it all started in many institutions, outside of the norm. And, and I recognize the fact that institutions of higher education are incredibly difficult to innovate, incredibly difficult to innovate. And that's why many a times the only way to do it is to have some sort of separate projects, some sort of separate institution or structure to be able to develop an innovation and then have that gradually incorporated. But um, what you're describing is, is, is very common. What you're describing is, is part of the reality that we have in higher education where how do you, how do you have to wait for somebody to die before you can get into their courses to do something differently. It's, it's a sad situation you're describing. It's almost hysterical, but it's true. I'd like to just say that I, I had the opportunity to witness a phenomenal presentation uh, this past uh, October. Uh, I cannot remember the name of the institution, but I, I have their PPT deck, and I would pass it to you. You should contact these people. They were, uh, for me, I agree 100% with everything that you have just said but it has to come from the faculty. You have to, it has to be driven by the faculty. You have to find faculty. That's what this, this uh, institution did, the same structure as yours. See, I can't speak to this because I work for a proprietary institution and things are really deemed from the top down. So, you know, um, and we try very hard to get faculty input and faculty buy-in, but in your particular instance, there are, and actually I could think of another, a second college that has a very similar situation, and it's really a push from the faculty. You know, you need to have that uh, faculty come together and really decide how they want to move forward, putting integrity and quality and distance learning, you know, using effective practices in the field by complementary institutions, things like this. But contact me and I'll, I'll get you that, that information. Edgar, could we have a last comment? It's very deep and very oh. philosophical, <laughs> okay? Finish with you. Yeah. So, so listen clearly, listen carefully. It is easier to change the course of history <laughs> than changing a history course. Nah. <laughs> well.
Uy, sí, pues, terminamos eh, exitosamente. Muchas gracias al panel, que ha tenido una excelente discusión y gracias a ustedes por la participación.